All right, it is my great pleasure to introduce University of Washington Dean of Engineering, Nancy Albritton, who is moderating this panel. Dr. Albritton joined the University of Washington as the Frank and Julie Jungers Dean of Engineering in November of 2019. In this role, she serves as the Chief Academic Officer of the college, which is a top 15 nationally ranked public university program with annual research expenditures exceeding $159 million. And she provides leadership to over 279 faculty and more than 8,000 students. Under her leadership, the college launched an inclusive and wide ranging strategic planning effort, advanced initiatives to build an inclusive and equitable environment for learning, research, service, and outreach, and furthered plans to construct a student focused new facility, the interdisciplinary engineering building, to help address growth in student enrollment. Dr. Albritton is an international expert on stem cells. Four companies have been formed based on her research discoveries. She also teaches in the UW Department of Bioengineering. She has been nationally recognized for her research and is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the American Institute for Medical and Biological Engineering, and the National Academy of Inventors. I'm going to thank Valerie Hummer, one of our members of Students for the Exploration and Development of Space for monitoring our Q&A. These sessions are more fun with audience participation, so submit your questions in the Q&A. They're in the Whova platform, so you should be able to see it over on the right-hand side. And feel free to chat with other attendees in the chat. Dean Albritton, I will let you take it from here. Great. Uh, thank you, Christy. Um, and uh, I'm really excited to be here. I joined the UW uh, almost two years ago exactly. And for most of the time I've been Dean, we have been remote. Uh, so I'm super excited that this fall quarter we're all on site and the campus is up and running and it's an exciting place to be again. Um, I was also really enthusiastic about uh, moderating this panel uh, on space design for social good. I'm a biomedical engineer, uh, but I can uh, understand the impl implications for space travel, et cetera, and biomedicine. And I have to say, I'm fascinated with the work of our Aero Astro uh, uh, faculty and also the Space Policy and Research Center. Um, so uh, the timeliness of this panel is also, I think, perfect for the College of Engineering. As Christy mentioned, we just uh, launched our big strategic plan that'll take us through our next steps and for the next five years. And really it has a focus on creating a healthier and more just world through our work. So making sure uh, engineering benefits everyone. Uh, this panel, is intended to focus on how space technology can be leveraged to address societal challenges here on our very own planet. And I'm really uh, keen to learn more from our panelists about how we can incorporate innovative space research into our vision and mission to serve the public good. So with that, I'd like to uh, have a quick round of introductions. Uh, each of the panelists, I'll call on you sequentially and if you could provide um, an introduction to yourself um, and how you uh, understand social good and its relationship to space design. So I'll start out first uh, with David. Uh, go ahead, David Sheen. Okay, um, so uh, hi, I'm David Sheen. I'm an assistant professor here at the University of Washington in Civil and Environmental Engineering. I've actually been at UW for over 10 years. I did my PhD over in Earth and Space Sciences in the College of the Environment. Uh, and worked at the Applied Physics Lab here as well. So my primary research focus these days um, involves developing and applying new methods and tools for satellite remote sensing and data analysis. Um, we we'll think about a lot of science applications, um, mostly focusing on the Earth's cryosphere. So these are cold, frozen places on our planet. It also includes areas in, in here in Western Washington, up in the Cascade Mountain Range, for example. Um, I've actually been working with satellite data emissions for over 20 years now. It's kind of hard to believe, um, both on the science and the technology side. So I got my start in the Mars Exploration Program, working with some of the early missions, the Mars Global Surveyor, the Mars Odyssey, looking at some of the first high-res images on this, of the Martian surface. Um, I worked for a NASA JPL subcontractor on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter mission uh, as part of the science operations team. Um, I was thinking about climate change and glaciers on Mars at the time. So climate change is a planetary process. So it happens here on the Earth, it also happens on Mars. Um, and that really kind of brought me back to the Earth um, and thinking about how climate is changing here and how the, the Earth's cryosphere has been changing. 
And I care about that. I live here, you live here, you know, 7.7 .7 billion other people live here on this planet. And so um, I think it's important to be studying the Earth's ice sheets or mountain glaciers, seasonal snowpack across the Western United States, but also other parts of the planet, including high mountain Asia, where there are over a billion people living downstream of this, these glaciers and snow. Um, so I think about sea level rise. I think about water resources and natural disasters in terms of applications for social good. And we, we use a range of Earth observation satellites and data sets to do this, including data from commercial companies, as well as NASA, ESA, and other space agencies. So in terms of social good, um, this is something I feel like we all say, oh, of course, we understand what social good means, right? It's actually, it, I had to look up a couple of definitions. And what I came up with was social good is something that provides the greatest benefit to the largest number of people. Um, and viewed through an equity lens, you know, in terms of the biggest impact, I think it provides benefit to those who are most in need. Um, so I, I kind of landed on a few different uh, topics, but social good, it can be direct, right? Something like clean drinking water, clean air, food, healthcare, or it can be indirect. And that can involve things like knowledge, technology, services, or even data products, really information that can significantly improve people's lives. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity with space and earth observation, and societal applications, there's a lot of value for individuals as well as businesses, nations, and the world um, in ways that really affect people's lives. So I'll stop there and share some other thoughts later. Thanks. Thank you. Stephanie Bostwick. Hello, I'm Stephanie Bostwick. I teach engineering at Northwest Indian College, um, which is housed at the Lummi Nation in Bellingham. And our program focuses on renewable energy, microgrids, um, basically uh, energy infrastructure for tribal communities um, so that students can learn how to design, build, manage um, that infrastructure for their communities to give tribes equal access um, and management of their own energy. Um, right now in the US, you know, a lot of tribes are remote and they don't have the same access to energy um, when it comes to resilience, you know, tribes experience long outages because the utilities aren't quick to restore their energy when they have an outage. And a lot of people don't even have access to power. Uh, even in the Lummi community, we have roads that don't have the infrastructure to deliver power to individuals. And, um, you know, the local utilities don't want to uh, give the resources to get that energy to individuals because you know, the cost benefit isn't there for them. Um, so we're really focused on, you know, getting energy to all tribal communities. Um, there are currently 574 federally recognized tribes in the U.S. And these are all, um, you know, sovereign tribes that are supposed to be able to um, manage their own communities and make their own decisions. And so, you know, building that infrastructure and giving that management to individuals within the tribes um, so that they have their equal access to energy and the, their own control over it. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, David Hendry. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Nancy. Um, I'm David Hendry from the um, UW Information School, um, where I co-direct the Value Sense of Design uh, Lab with my, my colleague, Batya Friedman. Um, value sense of design is an interactional theory and method that accounts for uh, human values in a principled and structured manner throughout the design process. And it was originally developed, originally pioneered by Bai in the 1990s with the, with the goal of um, helping uh, engineering uh, account for human values throughout the, throughout the design process. I, um, I haven't had a chance to work in space or work on space projects, uh, except for the last uh, few weeks where I've really uh, done some reading. And um, I'm just fascinated uh, about the opportunities to um, use some of the theory and some of the methods of value sense of design to think about um, space design for social, social good. Um, I guess I, I wanna make a couple of comments, um, just building on, um, um, on, on David and on Stephanie around the concept of social good. And I, I think to start, um, I think the word space design is fascinating because it's so broad. It can be very small things that we hold in our hand as well as massive infrastructures 
And the idea of space design can also be applied as our keynote speaker uh, suggested in a very interactive way with policy and with the design of engineering. So I, I think that that's um, really um, an important observation. And, and then maybe the third one about space design is that um, I think we also have an opportunity to to design the worldviews and the mental models that um, citizens hold for space and hold for the engineering process that creates um, things for space. So the focus on a Earth-centered orientation around space design, uh, I think is um, a really noteworthy as well. For, for social good, you know, I, I think there are many different ways of obtaining social good and many different um, constellation of human values uh, around social good. So um, that opens us up to different kinds of ethical frameworks for thinking about the concept, a kind of utilitarian cost benefit framework or um, a, a more of a human, human rights type framework around, for example, human capabilities. Um, those, those are different ways in which we can start to think about uh, social good. But I, I do want to point out that when we say social good, we have to immediately say for whom is a social good. So we have to think about for whom we are talking about. And um, I think we also have to acknowledge that uh, as societies grow and as civilizations grow and develop and mature, our concepts of what social good are change as well. And I think we always have to be taking a critical view about what, what is social good in our current moment. Um, um, maybe two more comments. Uh, one is I think any, any definition of social good today needs to take into account the climate crisis and the very specific direct and indirect implications of activity in space. And I hope we'll have a chance to discuss that. And then finally, I will say that however we conceptualize social good uh, and space design, I'm sure it will be contested by some stakeholder groups and that we need to understand that those, um, those tensions are part of the process of um, making, making progress and conceptualizing how it is we want to make process as uh, human beings uh, rooted ultimately on, on Earth. Thank you, David. Ariel Sandberg. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, so my name is Ariel or Ari Sandberg, um, and I am hailing from MIT Lincoln Laboratory, where I'm a mechanical engineer. Um, so based out here in Boston, I'm currently working on a variety of public space and military application space missions. Um, prior to this, I was at SpaceX as a mechanical engineer on the Starlink constellation, which I'll be touching on a bit more later. Um, and that's based right out of Redmond. So I was working at their facility on their uh, large satellite constellation. That was some incredibly exciting work. Um, I have been really fortunate to directly contribute to space missions that have direct ties to promoting social good, whether it be through utilities distribution, through Earth monitoring, as David had been mentioning. And I'm really excited to dive into the details of what those enabling architectures have been. And so I'll be talking a bit more in a few minutes about small satellites and how is, that has been a truly enabling technology for some of these um, social good metrics that we're trying to maximize. Um, prior to SpaceX, I was uh, working on the Mars 2020 mission at JPL. Uh, one of my greatest passions is more of the, the deep space exploration and, and kind of expanding human awareness of what's going on in the universe. But I think there are some really incredible ways to impact terrestrial quality of life. And so looking to investigate that, looking to discuss that today and hopefully bring an industry perspective. So feel free to, to ask me questions um, about that domain. I'm really excited to discuss them with you all today. Um, and yeah, I think it's gonna be an interesting conversation. Great, thank you, Ari. Uh, Elizabeth Frank. How about now? Great. Awesome. Gotta love when your technology doesn't work. All right. So my name is Elizabeth Frank. Uh, I am the chief scientist at FirstMode, which is a Seattle-based engineering consultancy. We specialize in space and exploration systems and sustainability solutions. Um, so my background is in planetary geochemistry. My PhD is from the University of Colorado at Boulder. 
After that, I went to work on NASA's messenger mission. Messenger visited the planet Mercury, so did data analysis for one of the instruments on board that spacecraft. Then I decided to pivot my career from academia into the commercial space sector. Um, so then I joined uh, Planetary Resources, the asteroid mining company, um, which used to be based in Redmond, so local to Seattle. So what brought me out here to Seattle in the first place. And there I was the uh, director of the data product team, where I led the science definition for an asteroid prospecting mission. Um, then I joined First Mode. Um, First Mode does, like I mentioned, work in aerospace as well as sustainability. Um, we've really uh, focused for sustainability and decarbonization in the mining sector. And through that, I've worked directly um, with mining clients before on helping apply the principles of space systems engineering to help them solve their problems in their business and help them basically do better. And so my perspective is very much informed by that intersection of space and sustainability. And so when I think about social good, um, part of it's informed by, by that context and that background. I think about how um, the space industry often talks about abstractly in marketing language about how a company's activities will benefit humanity, but I find that there's often a disconnect between that lofty language and what actionable benefit is going to actually impact a human's life. And so I think it's really important when we talk about social good to connect um, those aspirations to actual goals. And so before, you know, space companies or space organizations, um, whatever they're doing in space, whether it's um, orbiting around Earth, whether it's exploring deeper into the solar system, um, we should all ask ourselves, you know, what meaningful impact is this going to have on humanity? Uh, who are those humans? Then on the flip side, what are the risks? Are they the same humans that are going to be impacted by the good stuff, or are they different people who are going to be impacted by the possible risks and negative consequences? And so then a risk analysis should be done to see, is this a net good for humanity in general? Um, and then also, uh, yeah, connecting that back to um, you know, just sustainability in general. I think all of this, uh, I think it's really interesting intersections between sustainability um, and like how we think about environmentalism and how that extends outward into the solar system. So I'm looking forward to exploring those connections later in the conversation. Great, thank you very much. It looks like we have a fantastic group of panelists. So I'm uh, enthusiastic for the questions to come, but just to start out to further frame our discussion, I'd like to ask Ari to provide an example of how space design can be used for social good, in particular discussing her research in small satellite architectures for obtaining data and pro providing utilities for the public good. Thank you, Ari. Hopefully you all are seeing my screen now. Okay, perfect. Um, so hello again, um, and I'm honored to be participating in this discourse today about space design for social good. Um, during my time as a mechanical engineer at SpaceX and now at MIT Lincoln Laboratory, uh, I've been grateful to contribute to several missions that have direct impacts to terrestrial quality of life. I'm excited to briefly explore these missions and touch on one of the emerging architectures in space, space design, which has really uniquely enabled them, and that is small satellites. So you may have been hearing the buzzword small satellites uh, throughout the industry in the past few years. And as the name suggests, these satellites are smaller than heritage systems, definitionally coming in at under 500 kilograms. However, beyond just their form factor, these satellites have upended traditional space design, allowing for faster iteration times, reduced system costs, and expanded capabilities for Earth sensing and utilities distribution. Today, I want to highlight two small satellite constellations as case studies that have enabled advancements in social good, namely the Tropics satellite constellation through MIT Lincoln Lab, uh, which is providing almost a 10 time improvement in tropical storm tracking rates, um, and the SpaceX Starlink constellation, which is providing a space-based infrastructure for global internet. Um, and you can see in the bottom right here, a picture of the Starlink satellites, uh, 60 of them that I worked on with the Earth in the background. So I just think that's pretty neat to see. Um, Starlink design and production is, as I mentioned earlier, actually right next door, uh, based in Redmond, Washington. So to dive right in, um, Accurate weather tracking is critical for countless industries and communities. 
In this image, we can see tropical storm activity from a single day in 2019, with six active tropical storms sweeping across the Western Hemisphere and six others flagged as potential risks being monitored for escalation. So the difference between a potentially worrisome storm and one that gets its own Wikipedia page can be a matter of just a few hours. And unfortunately, our existing weather mapping infrastructure is limited in its ability to capture these rapid timescale evolutions. The tropics constellation was specifically developed with this need in mind. So tropics is a CubeSat constellation aimed at providing rapid temperature, moisture, and precipitation data of tropical cyclones. Each of the six satellites, which you can see here in the bottom right, in this constellation cost less than a million dollars, and they're each about the size of a loaf of bread. Um, however, working in concert, they're able to provide an almost 10 times increase in how frequently we're able to image a given storm, allowing us to better predict its growth and its impacts to public safety. Um, so as mentioned uh, in, in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see these groups of, of satellites which are actively waiting for launch. Um, a Pathfinder was just launched this past June, and I'll be talking about data from that mission shortly. Um, and in the top right, we can see a visual uh, visualization of the orbital distribution of these vehicles around Earth. So to really crystallize some of the potential benefits of this small satellite infrastructure, I want to provide a comparison of a tropic satellite to the National Polar Orbiting Operational Environmental Satellite System, or MPP, uh, which is a weather satellite operated by NOAA that was launched in 2011 and is still operational. From these metrics, we can see some key benefits of small satellites. For example, a satellite in the tropics constellation is over 200 times lighter and 2,000 times cheaper than the MPP spacecraft. Um, and with its low cost and small size, tropics can readily be deployed at quantity as a constellation of vehicles. And with more satellite surveying, you can measure the same storm more regularly, in this case, around every 30 minutes compared to MPP's four hours. And lastly, with its rapid development cycle, Tropics can leverage the latest advances in sensing technology, while larger, longer programs like MPP are often limited to just selecting low-risk systems that sometimes have existed a decade before they're actually going to launch. The first Pathfinder um, unit, so kind of a test unit, for the Tropic Satellite Constellation was launched this past June, and we've already started to get some incredible data down from the mission. Here you can see thermal imagery of Hurricane Ida before and after landfall on August 28th and 29th. Um, and these promising results really validated this technology and engineers at MIT Lincoln Lab were really excited to see the rest of this constellation launch, um, which is scheduled for this upcoming year. So, I want to shift gears a bit and talk about a small sat constellation of a slightly different flavor, and that's SpaceX's Starlink. The goal of Starlink is to provide global, low latency internet via a space based constellation. Already around 2,000 satellites have been launched as a part of this constellation, with beta service being rolled out in parts of North America, South America, Australia, and Europe. And you can see a stack of these satellites uh, hanging out in a Falcon 9 fairing waiting for launch at Cape Canaveral. Now, with the societal changes wrought by COVID, internet has become an increasingly critical utility for accessing basic services such as education and medical care. The Starlink constellation is offering rural communities the opportunity to be connected via high-speed internet often for the first time, opening access to these key services. And last year, SpaceX partnered with the Ho Tribe in Western Washington, significantly improving what had been almost non-existent connectivity in their community. Similarly, Starlink has enabled remote learning for school districts in rural areas across the US, including Ector County in Western Texas and Wise County in Southwest Virginia. 
Starlink also has served as a critical resource for frontline responders during natural disasters when ground-based infrastructure is often compromised. For example, Washington's Emergency Management Division used Starlink to connect areas damaged by wildfires. Emergency operations teams used Starlink to help with coordination during Hurricane Ida. And Starlink terminals offered connectivity for responders during the flooding in Germany last summer. Now, this is certainly not intended to be an exhaustive list of communities and applications that can benefit from space-based internet, but hopefully this gives a sense of its potential to improve social good. So thank you for your time, and I look forward to addressing your questions today. Hopefully this just kind of what's, what's your appetite, gives you a bit of context for some of the very tangible missions that are currently launching, there is a lot of excitement and a lot of development in the industry around these sorts of constellations and applications that directly impact life on Earth. So thank you. Wow, what a wonderful example, Ari. Thank you so very much. Um, so uh, I'd like to invite the other panelists uh, to provide other examples of space design for social good. And my, we'll start out if you have uh, an example. Uh, anyone, uh, all of the panels or a subset of the panels might want to provide feedback. Uh, we'll start out by trying just unmuting uh, and seeing how that works. Anyone? There must be some takers. I'll jump in with my planetary scientist hat on. I mean, um, as an example, I worked on the messenger mission, like I mentioned before, and it's just one of many um, NASA missions that uh, the, the planetary science division of NASA um, has done to explore the solar system. And so for that, the goal and objective is just to expand our understanding of processes in, in our solar system to see new worlds that you know, humans can't, with our bodies and eyes, go there ourselves. So we have to use these robots to be you know, our eyes and our senses and to collect that information and send it back to Earth. And, and that's a purely knowledge-based um, motivation just to understand. And then I think also it taps into um, human desire to explore. I mean, uh, we've explored so much of the Earth. Um, there's still plenty left, especially in the oceans, to, to see. Um, but certainly when it comes to space, there's just so much out there that um, I think it really taps into something that's an integral to all of us as humans to, to want to see what's beyond Earth. Great example. Others? What, what, what really struck me about Ariel's examples were how concrete they were. Uh, and, you know, a, a really nice response to Elizabeth's concerns about the aspirational aspects of social good. So we see the very, very concrete, um, concrete examples through communication and through modeling of systems uh, for how that can be a, a social good. Um, the, um, the, the UN has an interesting uh, approach to space and the uh, development goals. And uh, I think um, that we can learn something from that uh, as another example. So each of the uh, UN development goals has a space component to it. And in that space component, there are very specific um, goals and objectives. And then there are programs that support those objectives. So the way social good is obtained in, in that approach is, is, is by a kind of uh, means ends uh, analysis right from the, right from the um, developmental goal down to the specific technologies and policies that need to be put in place to support it. So I think that's, a, that's an, a, an example approach. Um, maybe just to put two other ideas out that maybe people could discuss, um, are, are these uh, new systems around uh, mapping carbon, um, where, where CO2 is being emitted. And what is so impressive about these to me is the granularity, both in terms of the temporality, so you get lots of readings but also the very local, you can uh, monitor, for example, a farm or a feedlot or a neighborhood or a factory. And that seems like a tremendous uh, instrument for um, dealing with decarbonization. So I'd love to hear other people's thoughts about that example. Super, thank you, David. And that also might pair up with a second sort of question as to what can we learn from these examples? So if you have another example, uh, let us know or want to comment on uh, 
some of the insights and knowledge that we can gain uh, from hearing Ari's examples are some of these others. Yeah, so I have another concrete example uh, that, that ties back into what David was just mentioning and, and also with land use and urbanization. Um, and if you'll let me uh, steal the screen share for a moment, I, I have a, a picture. Um, okay, so hopefully we're seeing that screen again and hang on, play from current slide. Oops. Okay, so I do a lot with student outreach, and so I have a few other examples that I like to provide for them, and, and I want to draw the atten our attention to both the GO satellite constellation and the Landsat satellites, and specifically with the Landsat satellite constellation. These satellites have been monitoring um, Earth for the past 50 years, and they have provided the uh, truly critical information regarding how land use, climate change, urbanization, uh, glacial change has taken place over these decades. And we've been able to get data like what you see here with this image, where we uh, mapped a glacier in Greenland in 1972, and we took an image in the same location in 2019. And these kinds of satellite constellations are able to provide us with really quantified information, high-res photos, various other remote sensing uh, data acquisition uh, data sets. And we have been able to learn about global trends in a way that is unique to being able to observe from space. And so I absolutely think when we're trying to think about how is climate change impacting our various environments, how are these communities, um, like what is urban sprawl looking like in light of climate change, um, this is enabled by these multi-generational constellations that are spanning 50 years. GOES is another um, satellite constellation, which is kind of the bedrock of how we do our weather monitoring right now, um, and is directly providing the information that then flows back into our meteorological predictions. So um, I also just have a, a really cool video from GOES. Um, that we were, a were able to collect. So using these satellites, we can get um, 3D images and modeling of storm systems that's, that are allowing us to understand their physics, their evolution um, in ways that were not possible or were extremely dangerous when we had to fly manned aircraft in, into or near the eye of a storm. Now it can all be done, you know, from, from the safe distance of low Earth orbit. Um, and so this was Hurricane Florence. And at the time I was speaking to a community in, in South Carolina. And so it's like, yeah, right next door. This is what we were able to learn about um, your community that had been hit by, by this hurricane. And so um, I think there are there are so many examples. There are dozens. There are hundreds, uh, and it has, in quiet ways, completely redefined how we understand and how we track changes in our terrestrial environment. And so, um, though I am driven by the more curiosity aspect, um, as was kind of being touched on earlier, uh, I think it's easy to take for granted how literally us knowing whether it's going to be sunny tomorrow is uniquely enabled by the space design and architectures we've already launched and are continuing to iterate on. So just wanted to provide some, some fun pictures that I've found have resonated with students. Love those pictures and I'm ready to go back to graduate school, Ari. Um, <laughs> So we've, we've heard a lot about satellites. Uh, what are some of the other tools and methods uh, that our experts uh, might see uh, that have come from aerospace and might also be utilized for social good here on Earth? Um, I think have a specific example for this one. So um, spacecraft are extremely complex systems, um, both from a technology perspective and for the larger spacecraft like Landsat, like what Ari just showed, uh, from a personnel perspective. Um, just as an example for um, the Apollo program, th uh, 300,000 people worked on that program. So that's a lot of people. That's a lot of information. How do you flow to information to the right people at the right time to make sure the rocket works the first time? Right? That's the thing with space. You have to have everything work the first time. There's no second chances, with the notable exception of Hubble. Um, so the, the, the way that you manage that complexity is through a process called space systems engineering. And it's really a philosophical approach to technical management of information that really makes sure that you get it right the first time. Um, and so First Mode, the company that I work for, um, we take that set 
of, of uh, processes and procedures, and we apply that to problems here on Earth, for example, within decarbonization. Um, one project that we have where that's been successful um, that we're actively working on is taking a large mining haul truck. Um, these are huge vehicles, 300 tons. Um, they emit a ton of CO2. They're really dirty vehicles. Um, and basically taking the diesel engine out and retrofitting it with um, a hybrid uh, hydrogen fuel cell battery power plant um, that can power like six city blocks. Um, it's almost two megawatts. Uh, so that's like the way that we manage that and approach that problem is from a systems perspective um, through the lens of space systems engineering. And so that's um, a abstract uh, set of philosophies and principles that can actually be used to solve concrete problems here on earth. Great, thank you. Um, other ideas or thoughts? Uh, or we can move on to our next question. I just wanted to go back to um, <clears throat> Ari's example of like Starlink. I think it's important to, um, as we come up with these technologies and deploy them, think about how we're giving people equitable access to these technologies because, um, you know, you mentioned a tribe that, that got access and that's great. Um, there are 574 in the U.S. Um, how are we getting that access to all of these individuals? Um, not everybody can afford the price tag of a Starlink, you know, satellite. And so, um, you know, how are we actually taking these technologies and thinking about deploying them equitably to different communities? Because, um, you know, a lot of this information isn't getting to people equitably. Um, even, you know, the satellite imagery, it's, you know, people's access to in the internet is limited. You know, not everybody has the app that says the weather is going to be sunny today. Um, so I think that's an important point to look at. Stephanie, that's a great point. And it kind of feeds into our next question about the competing visions and just the mental models of space design and then how they align or they're misaligned with social good. Uh, so great point. Other comments from our panelists? Yeah, so I, I'll jump in here. So I've been thinking about this one a lot, and it's no secret that a lot of space is driven by defense or commercial interests right now. That is that is it. But I think tying back into some lessons or tools, I think taking some of these considerations into account from the start when designing some of these defense missions and some of the spin-offs or other applications of these things that might be used in the future has real benefit. So one example that, that comes to mind is the, the GPS constellation, the global positioning system here in the United States. This is defense project, Air Force, started in the 1970s. Um, and today, everybody has a GPS, maybe multiple. You've got one sitting in your pocket right now, right? Um, and that's not, that's one constellation. That's just the United States constellation. There are dozen, well, there's hundreds of these satellites. There's the Russian constellation, the Chinese constellation, the European constellation, and regional systems from India and Japan. You can access all of those satellites. It's a passive receiver, right? So there's no subscription. There's, there's no cost associated with this. So wherever you are on earth, you can tell exactly where you are for navigation, mapping, other purposes. Um, and I think that's, that's, in my opinion, one of the most impressive, like indirect social good that's come out of kind of the defense motivation for space. Great. Thank you, David. Um, yeah, and that that is a great point. And, and to Stephanie's point of how do we ensure equi equitable distribution or access to these resources? Um, in the case of the Ho tribe, it was actually the Washington State Department of Commerce that facilitated that partnership. And so I think there is an element of um, industry partnering with government and to access, subsidize, or, you know, facilitate um, getting these, these utilities to them. And um, I am, my, my academic and professional backgrounds on the uh, engineering side as opposed to the government relations, public relations side. So I look forward to learning about that more, you know, through the, the public policy school and UW, but um, it seems that there is a solution space here between government partnerships with industry that can help that can help finance and sub, uh, subsidize access because it, it's absolutely true that there is there is a often a cost barrier to access that is prohibitive um, to some communities but I think there's a precedent for 
for state intervention that that could potentially help mitigate that. And that is an important thing to think about as we're in the rollout stages and kind of like the beta service phase of a lot of, of these constellations, because I think it can be baked in. I think we can have a more equitable way of rolling it out since we're at kind of the start and the genesis of these being utilities. So um, I look forward to learning about how this can practically be implemented and what all the pitfalls are of government working with industry, but um, at least it worked in, in that particular partnership with the Hope Tribe. Thank you, Ari. This kind of, again, touches on our next question, which is, uh, what are the most pressing policy questions, openings, and concerns? And how can we think about um, government, think about encouraging and regulating uh, space design so that the outcome is public good or social good? So I know we've got probably some uh, great ideas and opinions from our panelists. We've heard about uh, government partnering with um, industry. Are there other models or uh, modes to move forward? Maybe maybe I can say a couple of words about um, worldviews. I, I think worldviews are, are really important for how, how the public um, might engage with the concept of space design. Um, so there's a, you know, a, a very technologically um, optimistic orientation around space. We just need to, we just need new technologies and that's gonna solve it. And, um, you know, we, we hear entrepreneurs talking about democratizing space and creating platforms that democratize space for future generations. And I think that language um, is, is a, a language around uh, a solutionism that technology can solve our problems. We just need to invest in it. So that's, that's one um, kind of approach. And another approach is the Luddite approach. Oh, you know, well, we, we, we don't need to know whether it's gonna be sunny the next day and we can check the wind to uh, predict the weather in our local environment. So we really don't need technology to tell us these, these basic things that uh, we were really excited about as engineers to invent and to recognize we can do that. But so that the Luddite view and, and you know, neither of these views, these are straw horses, of course. The, the challenge we have is to, is to steer our way between these and similar views and find a way of using technology appropriately that it really does, uh, that really does uh, lead us to uh, benefit as um, hum human beings. Um, so I, I guess uh, I would just like to say, I think there's a set of questions around how um, work in engineering can present these different worldviews to the public and, and generate support or um, generate dialogue uh, and participation so that um, civic society can participate in the shaping of policy and the shaping of engineering goals. Um, when uh, Sputnik uh, launched in 1957, um, the political philosopher Hannah Arendt said it was the most dangerous uh, technological development of all time, more dangerous indeed than um, nuclear uh, energy and splitting the atom. And the reason she said that was because it gave uh, human beings the idea that we could escape the planet, <laughs> that we could leave the planet and colonize the, the universe. Uh, and she thought that that was a very, very dangerous idea because it directed our attention away from our home to, um, to, the, to the other space. So what I'm saying is that we have some examples here of how profoundly important uh, the models that we have can, can be for enabling um, civic participation in this, this kind of work. Um, really great insights, David. Thank you very much. Others? Perhaps one of my most favorite questions is, what have been our past mistakes in history? I'm sure we've made lots of mistakes, and how can we aim to avoid those in the future? Well, I think the mining industry provides a template of mistakes that have been made in the past and certainly continue to make mistakes still, um, although and we work, are working with folks who are trying to improve that. But one of the most um, useful concepts that I've learned from the mining industry that I think can be applied to space is what's called social license to operate. And so it's the idea that you need buy-in from all affected parties um, before proceeding with a project or particular activity. 
Um, and so for a particular mining company or activity, what that might mean is that they have gates in their process where they say, okay, um, who are the locals who are gonna be impacted by this new project? Just as an example, mining is very dusty. It can carry over into neighboring communities. It's very loud from the equipment and the drone blast. Um, and even the vibrations of the blasting can vibrate the homes and the buildings of the communities nearby. So it's like a meaningful uh, quality of life impact for those nearby. Um, some communities can even be displaced by mining activities, right? And so the idea is that you talk to the communities first, you um, make sure that you have their buy-in. That could be through negotiating jobs, building schools, trying to improve quality of life. And it is I have seen projects be shut down because they did not have social license to operate with those communities, which I think is a really important thing for aerospace companies to consider in their activities as they proceed. Who are the impacted parties by this activity? Do we have buy-in? And I would argue that Starlink provides a good example of that in space um, because the astron astronomy community um, was horrified when they saw that the Starlink satellite on their astronomical observations, creating tension between uh, those two communities. And so I think they're working through that now through various working groups, um, but it provides a good example of how, how things can go sideways um, in space if you don't have buy-in early from all affected parties. Thank you, Elizabeth. Other intended negative consequences, I don't, they may be local or global thoughts from the other panelists. Um, well, something that I see coming up um, as far as a question on here, which I think may may um, be valuable to think of as far as negative consequences is space debris. Um, so pollution, uh, the earth analog being pollution on earth. And um, when we talk about this context, uh, leaving spacecraft or defunct hardware up there that is of no longer you know, scientific use and is just cluttering that space. Um, and I think there has to be a mentality of being a good custodian of space when you're launching. There are a whole bunch of international recommendations, such as um, directives that you must deorbit your spacecraft within 25 years of the end of its operational life in order to try to mitigate some of this stuff just hanging up there. However, there are not great ways to enforce it, especially if a satellite is not performing as intended on orbit. So there have been Unique, there has been decent buy-in across the industry to be responsible with this because it is kind of mutually assured de destruction in the sense that if you have a lot of clutter up there, if you're using anti-satellite activities on the military side and exploding a satellite into a lot of small pieces, whatever it might be, you degrade everyone's ability to safely exist up there. So in the case of Starlink, um, we are flying at a very low Earth orbit such that the atmospheric drag will passively deorbit the satellites if they're not actively station keeping within three to five years. So what does that mean? That means that we knew we were flying a huge constellation. Therefore, we knew we, there had to be a guarantee we would just not have our satellites existing up there indefinitely, that even in the case of something going wrong on the technical side, these satellites would naturally deorbit just due to friction from the atmosphere. Moreover, in order to get our FCC license, we had to show a full full demisability or meet a full demisability requirement, which meant this, the satellites not only had to deorbit, de they had to burn up in their totality such that no pieces reached the earth. So this was in order to prevent, you know, accidental uh, pieces falling on a, on a city, on a house. You've kind of, you've maybe seen some of those crazy photos of like a meteorite hitting a mailbox. Uh, you don't want a piece of Starlink hitting uh, your cow. And so, um, I think there are responsible ways and it, and things that at, we should encode into the, the policy and legislation around launches to try to enforce and make it required that you responsibly deorbit, that you try to mitigate debris as much as you can, that you have plans for demisability. Because absolutely, as we're getting into this era of increased access to, to space via increased rates of launches, lower cost of payloads, we're just going to see more and more multiplications, orders of magnitude, more things up there. And we're starting to roll out, but honestly, it's based off of goodwill in a lot of cases. And and we need to have it not be goodwill, and we have to have it, I think, be more of a politically driven 
um, incentivizer and um, how you do that on an international scale, how you do that on an international stage uh, is also a question that I would have for, for our policy experts and international relations experts, but I do think we need to legislate around um, space debris and I've been grateful to contribute to missions that thought about it and actively added mitigations for it. Great example. So we'll move on to some more focus questions for our particular participants and our, our panelists, but feel free to chime in, uh, any of the panelists, even though they may be directed uh, towards one person. So the first one is for Elizabeth Frank. Um, and how do you think about sustainability in the context of space? Yeah, I think first off, it's important to define sustainability because it's kind of, it's used so often these days that it almost can feel meaningless. And so, um, when I think about it, I think about it in terms of creating conditions for both nature and for humans to flourish. And so I think the important point there is the humans, because too often um, I think humans uh, get lost in that. When we talk about climate change, we want to make sure that we're both trying to you know, maintain biodiversity. We want to um, ensure the integrity of our oceans. We also want to make sure that humans um, can thrive and live and flourish and you know, live to their full potential. Um, so with that context in mind, I think that there's four different ways that space and sustainability, sustainability intersect. And I think that these are categories and we have examples from those categories that we've touched on throughout the discussion. Um, the first one is monitoring Earth from space. We've talked about that in terms of weather, in terms of land use, greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, uh, space is a great platform from which to observe the Earth on a um, long-term time scale. For example, Landsat's been around for three to four decades, and so we have these long-term measurements. But we also can, you know, look at our phones and see what the weather's going to be today. Um, the other, our second one is maintaining sustainable space environments. Um, so in the sense of orbital degree being a great example of, you know, again, being good stewards of our environment, and that includes low Earth orbit. And making sure that we're keeping it um, in a good spot for both not just people today, but people in the future. Um, the third is considering environmental and social impacts of activity here on Earth. Um, one trend that's happening in the aerospace industry and beyond aerospace as well is publishing um, ESG or environmental social governance reports, which are basically accountability statements that say what the social and economic and um, environmental impacts of a particular company's activities are. And so shareholders are increasingly demanding that these things be made public for discussion and understanding of how a company is impacting um, its shareholders, but also those beyond you know, the company itself. Um, and so I think that's going to be important to acknowledge. I mean, one can you, have you actually even seen discussions for um, greenhouse gas emitted by particular rockets, right? And so you can start to quantify these things and see what the net pros and cons might be. And finally, using lessons to, from space exploration to tackle climate change here on Earth. And I could give an example of that um, in terms of using space systems engineering to solve problems here on Earth. And so those are four different ways that I see as we move forward and start to explore, even for the where we've explored so far. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, our next question is for David Hendry. And I think you touched a bit on this, but perhaps you could tell us a bit more on how might value sensitive design contribute to design of space technologies? Right. Well, uh, value sensitive design is, is, is meant to um, help engineers and technical designers uh, bring human values into the design process. And um, the work begins um, really up, up front in the definition of what a human value is. So within VSD, um, we define a human value as what is important to people in their lives with a focus on ethics and morality. And it, it starts with very basic things. For example, it could be as simple as, and as important as, um, do I have clean water to drink? Um, or it could be um, um, clarifying a more abstract value. For example, what is privacy and how does satellite technology impact privacy? For example, there may be some people who live places where they really don't want uh, satellites uh, uh, sensing uh, the kinds of things they're growing in their backyards uh, or other, other kinds of censoring. So how do those, um, those stakeholders uh, f uh, fit into um, the design process? So VSD has ways of doing that. One key um, distinction in value sensitive design is the distinction between direct and indirect stakeholders. So um, uh, the d indirect stakeholders are, are those people that are impacted by a technology that is to be used by others. 
and uh, VSD makes a commitment to bringing their interests into the design process so that the tensions that may exist between different kinds of stakeholders are, are addressed. Um, the um, other aspect here is that the concept of stakeholder is very broad, so it can, it can involve both human beings as well as non-human animals and ecosystems. And within this space um, uh, uh, kind of realm, uh, one indirect stakeholder that might be quite important um, is the stratosphere or the higher, higher parts of the atmosphere that might be impacted disproportionately by rocket debris and rocket activity. And that seems like an area that um, is, has not yet been um, investigated. There's a set of research problems there perhaps about what, what all of these small rockets, uh, the impact, the cumulative impact they might have on um, the forcings and, and climate models and so forth. So uh, maybe I'll just leave it, leave, leave it, at, leave it at that, but um, I'd be very, um, it'd be wonderful to collaborate with anyone here that's working on space projects and to explore the ways that value sensitive design might be useful in your projects or perhaps um, ways of improving value sensitive design so it becomes more useful. Thank you, David. And I'll direct this next question towards Stephanie Boswick. So uh, Stephanie, we've heard some great examples um, in the discussion so far, but I'm hoping you might comment more specifically how some of the tools and lessons from space design could serve the needs of indigenous communities with whom you work. Oh, you're muted. Sorry. Again, I think um, going back, you know, to the equity piece, um, you know, when you look at even just, you know, space travel right now, um, space travel is something that's for a certain group of people and not everybody else. There's no equitable access, but it's disproportionately impacting all other communities, right? The you go back to the rocket fuel and everything else. Um, you know, you're you're having impacts on communities that have no say in it. Um, and I I think that it is important as we develop these new technologies. Um, that we think about how, how they can be used in communities. Um, going back to the GPS, um, you know, yes, GPS is accessible to anybody who has a device. Um, not everybody has a device. Not everybody has, I mean, you can go out near here to the Nooksack community. Um, there is no signal out there. You can't get, you know, you can't get access to that GPS because there's not even a cell signal. Um, you know, so if you're in Nooksack, you can't turn on your cell phone and, and get a GPS signal and figure out where you're going. Um, <laughs> so it, you know, we really do have to think about um, with these technologies, how to, how to make things accessible to everyone. And um, I think leaving it up to the government to figure out, uh, we can see from past history that that's not necessarily going to work. And, and so I think we need to be really forward in planning and, and figuring out ways, um, you know, even as individual companies, how am I going to make this um, technology accessible to everybody, you know, without having to wait for the government to step in and, and fund something? You know, what, what can we do when we're planning um, to make sure that it's, it's being accessed by everyone? Um, and, you know, looking at things from an energy perspective, I think, you know, it would be great if we could find ways um, to get energy to all communities equitably. And if we can use space to do that, um, that would be awesome because right now, you know, people don't have, um, or even, you know, the internet. We don't have internet in all tribal communities. And um, it would be great if we had a way to, to blanket, you know, get that to everyone so that, um, you know, it's hard to think about, but you know, we all take for granted what we have and what we wake up with every day, but we forget that there are people out there who, who don't have electricity, who don't have internet, you know, and you think these are really remote people. Um, well, there are people at Lummi Nation, which is, you know, just outside of Bellingham who don't have power, who don't have internet, who don't have a cell signal. Um, so, you know, I think it's really important just as we're designing and, um, you know, coming up with these technologies that we think about um, how we can make sure that they're accessible and, and not really relying on other entities to make that um, a thing. Thank you, Stephanie. I think that gives us all much to think about in the coming days. And so I'll, I'll focus this question on uh, David Sheen. 
And uh, related to your expertise in satellite remote sensing, um, you know, when you talk to uh, most people, myself included, uh, we generally think about defense and intelligence, you know, the bad guys uh, spying on the good guys and vice versa. So what's the state of publicly funded Earth observation programs and how are these uh, currently used for social good? I know we've had some nice examples, but if you can kind of give us a broad perspective. Yeah, yeah, we've had some great examples today. So most of my experience is with NASA and ESA, the European Space Agency. They're both relatively well-funded, have a long history, and have a clear prioritization of science in, in their mission objectives. Um, so uh, when you look at NASA's vision or mission statement, it, you can go to their website, and it's to discover and expand knowledge for the benefit of humanity. That's a very short, simple thing. If you continue reading down, you see there's multiple ways that you can do that, including commercial and industry partnerships, you know, economic growth, et cetera, technology transfer. transfer. Um, but ultimately the social good is baked into the mission statement for an agency like NASA. Um, and to do that, they have dozens of publicly funded non-defense missions. They're, they're up there right now, as we're speaking, they're collecting data about our earth uh, and throughout the solar system. Um, and they're doing that across the electromagnetic spectrum, all right? It's not just pictures. You know, pictures are great, like the one in my background, right? You can tell a lot from that. We're very visual creatures. But these, set, these sensors, they go out into the hyperspectral uh, portion of the spectrum, thermal infrared, so measuring temperatures, microwave sensing, so radars that can see the surface through clouds and at nighttime, and even lasers to measure surface topography changes and how the ice sheets are melting and changing on the Earth and how the ocean is changing. Um, so there's a broad spectrum. I encourage you to look at some of these resources. Um, the other thing NASA has is an applied sciences program, which their entire mission is to get data and insight into the hands of these stakeholders. All right? So not just scientists like me who have all the tools and equipment to, to know what to do with the data, but get it to people who need the information, the farmers who, who need this about to know whether they should water their crops, for example. Um, and also in terms of understanding natural resources and natural hazards. Um, and how they're changing on our planet. So the one final thing I'll say about NASA and ESA at least is that they have very strong, and this is a relatively new development, strong firm policies about open science. Open science, open data, distribution of any publicly funded data sets, open scientific publications, tools like software and reproducible workflows. So really th there's this move, it is not for just us, it is for the greater good, the public good. And that's not true of all the, the space agencies on the earth. And the hope is in the coming decades, more and more agencies will, will start to enact those policies. Great insights. Thank you, David. Uh, we're just after 1045. So we, uh, we'd like to take our remaining few minutes with some question and answers from the audience. And so Valerie Hummer here is an undergraduate at UW. Uh, she's with our students for the exploration and development of space chapter. And she's uh, been busily monitoring uh, the question and answer. So Valerie, do we have any questions from the audience? Yeah, we have plenty. Um, I think we could start off with uh, one question that's, where does human spaceflight fit into all this? Um, and does the tension of launching um, like some people under, under minor effect efforts to communicate the value of space. Please, panelists, unmute and go for it. Yeah, so there's a whole field of investigation called bioastronautics, which I think is incredibly fruitful, specific to human spaceflight and relevant to terrestrial life. So we found through launching astronauts that a bunch of unusual effects happen to the human anatomy from muscle atrophy to eye deformation to spinal compression and like um, and understanding why the why these effects are happening how they can be mitigated how to preserve human health in these sorts of extreme environments can be very relevant to just better understanding uh, human processes. And certainly when we have these aspirational goals of, of putting a person on another planet um, or having them stay up in these low gravity environments for an extended period of time, it's absolutely essential that we have these incremental investigatory human spaceflight missions so that we can better understand 
these effects. And so this has been very relevant through the International Space Station, where we had Scott and Mark Kelly in the twin study of seeing how uh, someone in space for a year, what that looked like compared to someone on the ground. And so I think there's an incredibly rich and fruitful area of study specific to human spaceflight. And though my career has been based more on, you know, satellites, remote sensing, um, that's that's not to say there aren't a lot of help. So uh, a lot of important science going on on the human side, especially with human spaceflight. There, there's been just an abundance of spinoff technology that has also been very relevant to terrestrial life. So um, memory foam, artificial heart pumps. There have been a lot of really interesting things that have come for our human spaceflight program. And so um, Hell, even shelf-stable tortillas. I think that's my, one of my favorite examples uh, because astronauts love their tortillas. They don't produce crumbs like bread that can get stuck in the ventilation system on the ISS. Unfortunately, tortillas kept expiring early in mission, especially when these missions were multi-month. Um, so NASA invented flash freezing techniques and ways of keeping food fresh for longer that translated into shelf-stable tortillas. Uh, and we now find that in our local grocery store. And that was driven by launching humans. So there's a lot of really interesting spin-off technology. Um, now, is this are these efforts undermined by uh, kind of the millionaire, billionaires funding these? So um, I don't think so at all. Um, what I think, uh, so the benefit that I see from private industry engagement in crude launches is that we're overall increasing access to space, which I uh, consider just net positive, net good. So by encouraging participation by SpaceX, Virgin Galactic, Blue Origin, by having demonstrated crew launch capabilities, you know, even if the funding source is a millionaire, um, we are elevating the entire industry by allowing for competitive launch prices, by allowing for multiple different ways to get to space. And this trans this increase in access just translates to the pro proliferation of more of these utilities and more of these good things that we were describing. So, um, of course, NASA, the ESA, JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency, all of these agencies still have their own astronaut cores. I don't really see a future in which private industry totally eclipses um, having national astronaut cores, but um, I think it is all part of the healthy ecosystem and economics of making space viable. And um, so, yeah, I think human spaceflight is an important part of that, and I'm pretty excited by private industry getting involved too. Thank you, Ari. Valerie, why don't we take another question? Oh, you'll need to unmute. Oh, sorry, got the video. Uh, yeah, we had a question that was um, just came in as like a follow up where how can um, open access to SAT data be detrimental um, and how can it be mitigated? I, uh, I'm curious to hear examples uh, that others might consider. I, I always, my opinion is usually open is always better. Right, uh, more transparency, more sharing, more access is is always the an improvement in my mind. But um, Elizabeth, do you have or Liz, do you have a thought? Yeah, if you, I mean, yes, open is great for collaboration. I could say on the industry side, um, if you having that data access is actually intellectual property. Like that data is the product of the capital investment that a company put in to create that data in the first place. And so if, for example, there's a NASA contract that requires a company to make the data from their mission um, public, you're decreasing, um, or you're, you're removing their, their capital and their incentive to invest in further opportunities and technology and progress. Um, and so that's kind of an abstract, I guess, example. Um, I don't have a particular example in, that I can point to specifically, um, but I could see that um, you have to keep in mind from the industry perspective, competition is key to moving things along. I mean, that's why this, the space race um, resulted in people on the moon, right? Competition is key. And you're removing an incentive for competi competition from um, the industry sector if you force everything to be open. Um, so, but there could be incentives as well for companies to share their data. Um, so it, yeah, it's complicated is my answer, I guess. <laughs> One other thought just on, on this subject is um, just because it's open doesn't mean it's usable. 
right? So like putting out these science products without having distilled information that stakeholders and others actually need, that's, that's a limitation right now. Um, and I think there's a lot of, you know, there's also a fire hose of data coming in from all these NASA missions, all the commercial missions. So it's overwhelming. So we, we need the tools and the distribution networks to actually get people the information they want. We need analysis ready data. It's ready to be ingested by machine learning uh, tools and algorithms so that people get what, what they want out of this. I, I think that's just a really wonderful point that uh, the, the data needs to be organized in a way that um, stakeholders can make sense of it for their own uh, own purposes. And it, it gets directly, I think, to Stephanie's you know point about inequalities, that these forms of inequalities can be manifest in many different ways. And the example you gave, David, I think is a really wonderful example that for some stakeholders, the data makes perfect sense. For others for whom it could be very valuable, it's impossible, it's opaque, it's impossible to gain access to it. Valerie, we'll take uh, one last question. Sure, I think this works well as a follow-up, a question from earlier of, uh, do we know of any social good focus downstream, quote unquote, government or open source projects to analyze and distribute the data that comes down from space? Anyone? David? Ari, do you, do you have a thought? I mean, I'm just thinking of NOAA, like the Space Weather Prediction Center. Like there's, there are a lot of these, they're still government entities, but they're they're in the processing pipeline for take going from raw image to, in the case of the Space Weather Prediction Center, they actively release a daily report that is distributed to individuals who sign up. Um, so daily, what is space weather looking like today? And so what kind of environments are we expecting to see here? And um, this is very relevant to, for example, um, the solar power industry. And they may be interested in how flux is varying and things like that. And so there are actually some kind of baked in where it's almost newsletter style, like, hey, here's your like daily uh, debrief on, on what the data was that we got down from these NASA NOAA resources in the past 24 hours. Um, now, this is not a kind of umbrella where every mission necessarily has something that's as neatly packaged for public interfacing as, a, as that, but like those are, are some of the missions that, that come to mind as having that kind of like baked into their mission architecture. Thank you, Ari. Great. Um, we're near the end of our uh, time, so uh, in order to respect everyone's uh, time commitment, we'll go ahead and wrap up and finish our questions. I just want to thank the panelists, though. I have learned an amazing amount of all the pros and cons of space design. And I have to say, I'm really excited that the UW is going to play a role and have an impact. And then I can't just want to thank the panelists. I know you're all super busy. You've taken your time and your energy uh, to speak at the meeting. So a huge debt of gratitude goes out to you, as well as our uh, student, Valerie, for uh, monitoring our questions. So thank you everybody again. Um, and I think uh, Christy Sadia will wrap up uh, what's, with what's coming next. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dean Albritton. This was a great discussion and thank you to the uh, panelists for sharing your experiences, your insights and your thoughts. I think you've given us a lot to uh, think about. Uh, we now have a short uh, break. Uh, so I invite you all to virtually wander over to our exhibition and sponsor halls, uh, check in with Salal, check out some of our academic research and activities uh, here at the UW. At 1130, we have a uh, keynote uh, Q&A session, uh, which uh, Christy will be mon uh, moderating with Stan Schultz. So we look forward to having you with us then. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us and for giving us uh, this opportunity to learn from you. See you later. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.